Singh being with us today. Um, in your lifetime, I hope you have the experience that I've had of meeting people of stature, uh, but also people of graciousness uh, and warmth and hospitality all at the same time. So Dr. Singh is a scholar, but he's also, in the short time that I've already had a chance to meet him and get to know his family a little bit, um, also very kind-hearted people. Uh, I'm friends for life for Dr. Singh's son because of Ram Peeth. Did I pronounce that right? Ram Peeth Singh. Close. Uh, and uh, he bought me coffee, so I'm easily bribed. Uh, I'm very easily bribed in this, so that, that's completely fine with me. But uh, Sikhism is a very important faith tradition for a lot of reasons not the least of which is the impact and power of the tradition itself. And I hope all of you uh, took time to do the reading and understand some of the really fascinating, interesting uh, perspectives that are in Sikh Holy Scripture and in the wisdom of the Sikh tradition. So I would imagine that would, should be the most important thing. But in addition to that, uh, the culture and faith, the sustenance, the way this faith has helped people deal with unbelievable atrocities. How in the world did the people of the Punjab survive the hell that they've experienced literally for centuries? And the Sikh tradition was a force to keep people sustained, to keep people literally from going crazy. Uh, the British, uh, the, the uh, Mughal invaders wreaked havoc on the region killing tens of thousands of people. Sometimes you hear very charitable accounts of the Mughal Empire, and no doubt there are many sides to every story, and there are many sides. In fact, the Mughal Empire <coughs> spans a very long period of time. But some of the first Mughal rulers, uh, historically, without question, were also some of the most oppressive uh, rulers in terms of the causing the deaths of many, many people. That's not a reflection on the religion as much as it's a reflection on those, those Mughal rulers. But nonetheless, the, uh, the people of the Punjab had to endure horrors, horrors during that time. Uh, British colonialism was not at all kind. We see the darkest face of British colonialism in 1919 when machine guns were set up in an open square and uh, Literally hundreds of people, men, women, and children, were just mowed down in a senseless massacre by the British Empire. And that specific act of horror, more than any pamphlet, more than any uh, book or article or speech, changed the whole history of India. Because those people died, but yet their deaths had took on, shocked the world. And they shocked most of all the British people because the British people had heard that their empire was benevolent and they learned a whole different side of the story. I lived through the horrors of Vietnam and when we learned about what happened at My Lai, it changed the whole complexion. And We thank God for the bravery and honor of, of those in your family and mine that served in that war, but nonetheless, horrors and atrocities happen as, do they, all, as, as they do in all wars. So maybe it's inevitable. And then, of course, the greatest, uh, most unimaginable atrocities happened in 1947 in the Punjab. In 1947, at the moment of partition, the land between India and Pakistan became a killing ground. Literally, trains packed with tens of thousands of people were stopped in desolate remote areas, and every single person man, woman, and child, was hacked to death going south into India. And going north into Pakistan, the exact same story happened. As Hindus killed Muslims, and Muslims killed Hindus. And who's caught in the middle? Who was part of that? The Sikh people. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Singh, who is a survivor of that atrocity. He was four years old, and his train was stopped in the middle of a field. There were thousands and thousands of people on that field, in that train. Every single one of them, except those in the 12th train compartment, were slaughtered. The 
people in the 12th train compartment were fortunate that someone there had a gun. There was no weapons in it. There, I mean, there was no bullets. It wasn't loaded. But at least they were able to scare off the people with the threat. And Dr. Singh, age four years old, survived and he saw that happen. And it's tragic that it happened. It's even more tragic that we don't always know about these histories. And hopefully uh, you will make it part of your learning, your life going forward, to learn the facts about these kinds of realities, these atrocities. Because it's really, really easy to be glib and make glib statements. Oh, why don't people love each other? Why don't people get along? Why don't Palestinians and Israelis love each other? Why don't Sikhs and Punjab and, and, and Muslims and Hindus get along? That's beautiful to have platitudes ushering like a fountain from your mouth. But know your history. Know as best as possible what it means to be a Punjabi, a Sikh, a Hindu, a Muslim, responding to 1947. And if you know what you can know, it won't be shocking to you that still to this day there are lingering hatreds between Sikhs, Muslims, and Hindus. What's shocking to you is that Sikhs, Muslims, and Hindus can be as loving as they are to each other. That's the real amazing story, given what we know. So we want to welcome Dr. Singh to be our guest to be here for the next hour, and then we'll be leaving at about five after six. I want to show a brief excerpt about Sikhism in modern America that uh, Mr. Singh sent me to share with you at the start of class. My name is Erdin Singh. Uh, I'm interviewing Professor Faisalji. I'm interviewing him for a Comp 2 paper that I'm doing about racial profiling sexist terrorists. So I'm going, to answer, I'm going to ask you five questions, and you can answer it in any way you'd like. Okay. First question. After 9-11, the number of hate crimes against people of Indian and Middle Eastern descent has skyrocketed, many of them being against six. Why do you think this is? Uh, I'm really, um, really, very glad to know that you are uh, interested in such a topic which is very important for the community, which is very important for the American people, and which has a very uh, sensitive nature as well. Because after 9-11, there has been a lot of change in the scenario in American society. And uh, the hate crimes, I don't have any statistics, but whatever I read in newspapers or uh, uh, hear from other people, there is definitely an increase. And uh, uh, I feel the main reason behind it is the American society is a multi-ethnic society. There are people from so many countries who have come here as immigrants, but Interaction between all those ethnic groups is very divisive. It should be uh, done at the proper level because it is a big country and so many ethnic groups, so it's a big problem to deal with. Before 9th level, nobody thought of it that it would happen like this because America is known for its democratic uh, temperament. Uh, it is the cradle of the democracy. There are so many institutions and which are uh, working for human rights and basic human values. But this kind of scenario uh, in, uh, um, came into being after 9 11. And I feel the main reason behind it is before 9 11, there has been no concerted effort. There uh, has not been any uh, interaction on organizational level between different communities and different ethnic groups. That is the main cause of the problem. And even after 9 11 happened, no uh, specific effort has been made to deal with the situation. That is why it is increasing. Effort should be made at the government level, 
at the level of social organizations, uh, at the level of different ethnic groups to uh, contain uh, the problem so that in uh, the coming days, because we are living together, so uh, it, 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 it doesn't increase to any other alarming portion. Is there any kind of racial injustice that you personally experienced against you? Uh, I can say uh, I have not uh, uh, been a victim to any kind of situation uh, uh, like of that. I came to the uh, United States only five years ago and I have interacted with so many people, people from different communities, even Muslims, Hindus, Europeans, and uh, English people, and uh, Italians. But I feel these people don't know much about Sikhism. That's the basic problem. And our community, they have not done anything uh, solid to tell the people who these Sikhs are. The problem is, generally it is understood that I have a turban, and I have a beard, and I am a Muslim. And uh, the basic reason uh, behind all these hate crimes is uh, religious uh, uh, biography between different groups. For example, the people who committed 9 11, they were. Uh, uh, from uh, Muslim community. So every American started thinking like this, that uh, uh, Muslims are uh, uh, enemies of America, which is not uh, correct. We should not be uh, put in religious terms. So because we resemble uh, Muslims because of our beard and our turban, uh, 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 we, we are a victim of mistaken identity. In fact, people in the whole of the world do not know that six, uh, Sikhism started in the 15th century in India. And if you go to the, uh, go through the pages of Sikh history, you will find that we had to suffer a lot at the hands of Muslim rulers who were ruling in India at that time. And six fought for about 100 years against those uh, oppressive rulers. What I mean to say, we have never been uh, with good relations, uh, uh, we have no good relations with the uh, Muslim rulers of uh, uh, India of that time. But at the same time, it should be very clear that Sikhism does not believe in creating hatred on the basis of it. Our first Guru, Guru Nanak Dev if you know that he started his campaign of preaching religion in the company of a Muslim friend, Pai Maldan, who sang the Guru Nanak Dev And later on also, there were so many Muslim saints uh, Muslim reformers uh, and uh, others who were very friendly with the Sikhs, say Gurus and the Sikhs at large. And at the same time, uh, you also know that uh, uh, the uh, uh, foundation stone of Golden Temple at Amritsar was laid on by a Muslim who was uh, assigned me. So we have been very friendly and we believe in coexistence with other religions. So uh, the difficulty is that we cannot and we have no mechanism uh, to tell the people who we are. Personally speaking, I have not met any problem so far. And sometimes when I go to the uh, market or go to the uh, mall, uh, sometimes people think that I am also going to say uh, Allah. So I am not uh, concerned with that. Rather I tell them, I love Allah also, I love uh, uh, God also, 
but I am a Sikh and Sikhs say Vaheguru. Vaheguru stands for God. Okay? Uh, is it okay? Uh, then I tell them that uh, God uh, is same every day. It is same for me as a Sikh, same for a Muslim, same for a Christian. And this is the basic education of Operatia. And then they become happy. When they listen, they become happy, they become friendly. And uh, I tell them that uh, uh, Muslims are equally uh, uh, um, good friends of ours. Because we believe in humanism, we always demand uh, from our God, Vai Guruji, Sarvata Pala, welfare for the whole of them. So I have not met any, any problem myself or my family members. My third question. Even though Sikhism is the fifth largest religion in the world, not a lot of people know who a Sikh is. What can Sikhs do to educate people that Sikhs are out there? Uh, this is a very good question. And this is the main problem which uh, the Sikh people, the Sikh community is facing everywhere. Because this is the age of and the youthful faces facing me. I'm really very happy to be with you today and to give a talk on Sikhism. Uh, may I ask you a question? How many of you know something about Sikh? Can you raise your hands? You? No. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I know they'll wear turbans, like you guys don't cut your hair for a long time. Have you been and, to India? Oh uh, yeah, I lived there for five years, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Sikhism is the fifth largest religion so far as the numbers are concerned in the world. We are about 30 million. And most of us live in the northern state of India, which is known as Punjab. 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 I actually, we don't have one. Okay. Let me see if I have Punjab. Punjab means, Panj means five. Ab means water. The land of five water, five rivers. Punjab. That is the northern state of India. And Sikhism originated in that state of India in the year 1469 with the birth of Guru Nanak Dev, the founder of this religion. Guru Nanak Dev. 
before I give you a brief touch of the thank you. Guru Nanak Dev. He started this religion. He was born in the year 1469 at a place which is known as Nankana Sahib. Nankana Sahib. The name of the town was at that time Talavandi. But after Guru Nanak was born there, and Guru Nanak became the leader of the uh, community, community in those days. Later on, it was named in his name, Nanakana Sahib. So three or four things, basic things, you must know about Sikhism. The first thing, what does Sikh mean? Can anyone tell me what is Sikh meaning of the word Sikh? Disciple. Sikh means disciple, you're right. It, it is from Sanskrit word Shish. Shish is a disciple. And from Sanskrit, it comes to our language, Punjabi, the language of Punjab. It becomes Sikh. Sikh is a disciple, a learner. Uh, you are learning something, you are all Sikhs. The literal, if we take the literal meaning of the words, everybody is a Sikh because everybody is a learner in this classroom. And the second is Guru. Guru is teacher. Chris is your guru, and you are all learners, you are all six. Similarly, Guru Nanak Dev, who started this religion, he is the first guru, first holy teacher. And all the followers of Guru Nanak, they are known as six. So Sikhism is the religion of a teacher and a student, a disciple and a holy teacher. And uh, after Guru Nanak, we had nine more teachers, nine more gurus, you can say. From 1469 to 1708, we had 10 gurus. The first is Guru Nanak, then Guru Angad, Guru Amardas, Guru Ramdas, Guru Arjandev, Guru Hargobind, Guru Har Rai, Guru Hari Krishan, Guru Tej Bahadur, and the tenth is Guru Gobind Singh. Guru Gobind Singh. When Guru Gobind Singh left for his heavenly abode, in the year 1708, he ordained that after me, there will be no guru in the uh, human form. The guru will be the holy book. After Guru Gobind Singh, our guru, for all the times to come, our eternal Guru is our holy book. Our holy book is known as Guru Granth Sahib. Guru Granth Sahib. Guru Granth is book. This is a Sanskrit word. Sahib is master. We use this word for reverence. Guru Granth Sahib. I mean to say that after Guru Gobind Singh from this year 1708, we are uh, following the teachings of the Holy Granth, the Holy Book, which is our Guru. And it will continue forever. So, uh, so long as the Sikhs are alive, they will have their Guru 
as uh, uh, our holy form. But no person in human form, in physical form, can be uh, can get the status of guru in Sikhism. So the book is the holy book is Guru Granth Sahib is our eternal guru. And when we go to the Sikh place of worship, you go to as you go to church, the Christians go to church, Jews go to the synagogue, Muslims go to the mosque. The Sikh place of worship is known as Guru Guru Dwara. Guru Dwara. Guru Dwara. Means Guru's house. In that place of worship, you will find in the central place our holy book, the Guru Granth Sahib, is there. Installed in a palanquin on a raised platform, and every Sikh goes and bows before it and uh, tries to follow the orders, the dictates, the teachings of Guru Granth Sahib. So, one thing more I would like to tell you. The Sikhs are some, sometimes called Khalsa. Khalsa. K H A L S A. Khalsa. Khalsa is a Persian word which came from Arabic actually. Khalsa means pure. Pure. Our tenth Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, before leaving this world in the year 1708, in the year 1699, started a new tradition of baptism, you can say, initiation in, in the code of Sikhism, that was known as the Amrit ceremony. As in the case of Christians, we have baptism. There is a specific tradition Ceremony is done to uh, initiate into Sikh fold. And from that day onward, who took Amrit, who was baptized at that time, he has been advised to follow a specific code of conduct. Those who follow that code of conduct, they are known as the Khalsa. And for a Khalsa, there is no difference between Sikh and Khalsa. But it is a historical event. Uh, the, uh, Khalsa, the, the six at the first day, and the six after Guru Gobind Singh Ji, they became Khalsa. And Khalsa is supposed to keep his hair unshot. Sikh cannot cut his hair. Maybe the uh, beard, maybe hair in the uh, on the head, or at any part of the body. A Sikh will never trim. He will respect the uh, hair. Number two, he will have five Ks, five Ks with him, which is, uh, one is uh, Ks, they are called Ks because they start with the uh, letter K. The first is Ks, Ks is here. A Sikh is supposed to keep the hair. Number two is calm. Kangaha. Kangaha, you all know, we have a small calm in the, uh, on our head to clean the hair all the time. Then, we have a kirpan, a small sword. I am wearing here. It shows that I am a Khalsa. Then, I have a kara this bangle, steel bangle. And then I have an underwear which is known as kachera. Then again K. So these are five Ks which symbolize Khalsa, symbols of Khalsa faith, symbol of Sikhism, after Guru Gobind Singh Ji. Guru Gobind Singh Ji uh, gave this code of conduct to us. And uh, all these symbols mean something. They have a philosophy behind it. All these, uh, 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 every 
symbol has a philosophy behind it. For example, this is my Bengal Kada. Kada shows, it is in my right hand, it shows that I should not do anything wrong while living in society. It should remind me of my Guru when I am doing something with my hands. I, it, it will remind my Guru. So I will uh, be very careful uh, when doing something, when interacting with uh, some people, whenever, whatever I am doing in my life, I should do in an honest way. And this Kripan, it is called Kripan, not a sword. Kripan means, Kripa Shabba, uh, the word Kripa is from Sanskrit. Kripa means grace. It is the grace of my Guru. Because we had to fight against injustice throughout our history. So Guru gave us this Kirpan which shows that I will not tolerate injustice. If injustice, injustice is being done to anybody in the world, may not be sick, I will help him. I will help him. So in that way every symbol has its, its own meaning, its own philosophy behind it. So I would like to tell you that Sikhism is a monotheistic religion. We believe in one. For, for me, God is same. God is whatever God is for a Christian, for a Muslim, for a Hindu. We have only one God. This is the belief of Sikh, Sikhism, the best belief of Sikhism. Hinduism, we are different from Hinduism because Hindus believe in idol worship. They have so many gods. But Sikhism does not believe in more than one god and all the gods in the shape of idols uh, are forbid in, the, in Sikhism. They are not, they cannot worship. And uh, next thing I would like to tell you about a brief sketch of our history. When Guru Nanak Dev Ji started preaching his religion, there were two main forces in India. Actually, India is a Hindu country. It has a long history and we, we are proud that the ancient books, oldest books, religious books were written in India. The card Vedas, four Vedas on which the uh, uh, Hinduism is based. And the second force, religious force came to India in 10th century, that was Islam. And when Islam entered, there was a conflict between Hindus and the Muslims. And it touched very highest pro proportions. Every, everywhere in India, Muslims were killing Hindus, Hindus were killing Muslims, and they were saying that oh, my religion is good, better, your is uh, denounced and so on. And in that scenario, Guru Nanak appeared as a messenger of peace, love and welfare for all the humans living in the, living on this earth. And he started preaching peace, love among various uh, sections of the society. And because you are uh, students of religion, you know in India, we had so many other religions also. Buddhism also originated in India. Jainism also in India. And there are so many other denominations. But these are the uh, most uh, uh, main uh, re religious denominations which I have named now. And Guru Nanak, he started preaching that you should live in peace with one another. Why, why do you kill uh, others in the name of religion? 